Hello everyone, this is Craig Fitch with Oculus. Welcome to another Oculus webinar. We certainly thank you for attending this webinar. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Jack Holliday. Dr. Jack Holliday is a board certified ophthalmologist who received a medical degree from the University of Texas and a master's and bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Southern Methodist University. Dr. Holliday is currently a clinical professor of ophthalmology at Baylor College in Medicine he is the author of three books, hundreds of chapters, over 100 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, serves on 10 editorial boards and five medical advisory boards. Dr. Holliday is well known internationally, has received many medals and awards, and holds 12 patents since 1977. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please use the question box at the right of your screen. There will be an opportunity at the end of the webinar to answer your questions, and if uh, Dr. Holliday does find that your questions, uh, that he can answer them through the webinar, he will do so as well. So without further delay, please welcome Dr. Jack Holliday. Thank you, Craig. It's a pleasure to be here tonight and uh, to spend time to go over the Holiday Report uh, with users that explains uh, how we can use it for uh, IOL calculations, determination of corneal power, and uh, detection of keratoconus. So with that in mind, uh, I will try to advance the next slide here. I think you'll have to do that from me, Craig. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are my financial disclosures. And <clears throat> the next slide that we come up, just a second here, shows us that as you look in the center of the screen, you'll see the uh, slit that's projected on the eye, and then you see the camera. And of course, the camera rotates 180 degrees around in a circle so that you can capture the entire cross-section of slice uh, of the eye. We call this tomography, and it uses the technique of shine point. Now, with the device, this slit projection that we get, next slide here, shows us that the uh, camera sweeps through a total of 180 degrees. And what that does for us is allows us to get uh, 25 or 50 cross sections of the eye. And the biggest advantage over what we have had in the past is that, such as with the orb scan, which is uh, the first generation, it allows us to take the thinnest part of each slice, put it back together, and then create a three-dimensional picture. And uh, with the older devices, if you did a horizontal slice, you can't put it back together because you have no uh, reference to put them back together. So the result is you don't end up with a uh, three-dimensional image that's very accurate, next slide, simply because you can't create a three-dimensional image if you don't have a point of registration accurately. So as you see here, the registration allows us to make a very accurate, but within about 10 microns, uh, three-dimensional of the anterior segment. Next slide. So with this, we're able to then generate a report. Now, what I explained to the company when I'm working with the engineers to try to design a report is very simple. That the doctor sits in a room with a patient, and they need a report that's comprehensive, that provides all the information that's necessary to be able to examine and to treat the patient. And so, the doctor almost never sits at the instrument itself. The technician takes the instrument, the measurement, and the result is the report has to have all of the information that you need to know. Next slide up there. 
and we will have those on the report. We'll have uh, maps on the first page and then some details on the second page. Now, the first page that we see here, uh, I show that little map curvature, which is a scale that we set there. And most of the time, I tell the doctors that when you're selecting the setup, uh, we force, we have a thing called the holiday primary uh, color code. And what that does is allows you to best set it on fine and 15 colors. And the reason 15 colors are best is basically if you go from dark blue to dark red, what you find is that you can't really perceive more than a resolution of about 15 colors. As you go to 31 or 61, what happens is uh, you can't tell the difference between the two yellows. So what happens is when you look on the map, you really don't know what power that is. So 15 is the best. It gives you the primary colors, lets you see things well. And then, of course, most of the time, doctors work in diopters, not millimeters. Next slide. And so that's what we recommend that you set them on. Now, the other thing is, again, you don't want that American-style color that goes from purple to violet. Because basically, you can't tell the difference between a purple and a violet. To the eye, those are the same color. So it's much more uh, valuable to have it on the primary scale, and that's what uh, the holiday primary does. Next slide. So after you've done that, then the pictures you're going to get will look like uh, colors that have uh, a primary scale. Now, one of the maps that you are not familiar with most of the time is called the relative pachymetry map. Now, a normal pachymetry map is thinnest in the center, the eye cornea is a negative meniscus lens, so it's like a negative contact. The thinnest points in the center and it gets thicker in the periphery. It goes up by what we call the square or parabola, and that's the normal thickness because it's a meniscus lens. Well, since we know the thickness increase relative to the center, we can actually make a relative pachymetry map and show you what the thickness should be at all points on the cornea relative to what the thickness should be. So what you see here, uh, this cornea is thicker in the center than normal by about 2%. And out here in this little yellow area, it's actually about 1.5% to 2% thinner. Than now, if it's less than 5% negative, that is between 0 and 5, it's still within the normal range. And between 5 and 8%, it's two standard deviations from the mean, so those are suspicious. And when it's over 8%, it's actually uh, three standard deviations from the mean, so that would then be what we call abnormal. So 5% negative values that are bigger magnitude than that would be suspicious, and over 8% are abnormal. Next slide. Now, once we have established this, this would be uh, a map that we're looking at here. And what you see is a relative pachymetry map. And what you see is that these little areas where it shows 12% right here, 11% right there, well, those are uh, suspicious because they're near that 12. Now, what we use as the reference here is what's called a toric ellipsoid, which is the shape of a rugby ball, uh, like an American football, but American football is symmetry on the nose, so it's a spherical ellipsoid. And if you have two radius, like a, uh, a rugby ball, you actually end up with a toric ellipsoid. And that fit basically eliminates uh, the astigmatism and the normal prolate shape of the cornea. So that now the only thing that we see are irregularities. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about that visually in a second. But basically, if the height with a toric ellipsoid is over 12 microns, it's suspicious. 
and over 15 microns we consider it to be abnormal. Next slide. So uh, the next slide that we see is the entire map put together. So what you see is at the top you have these numbers that uh, we want to talk about. You have the biographical information of the patient. You've got the equivalent K readings there, and we'll talk all about those in a minute. Uh, and then we have other quantitative data, like the ratio of the front to the back, which should be 82%. We give you the value for what the uh, paradometric reading would be before they had refractive surgery, pupil size, epitometry, and uh, those values are helpful to the refractive surgeon. Then what you see is in the uh, first column, we have uh, the normal topography with an axial power map at the top, and then we have a tangential map at the bottom. Now the tangential map, some of you may not be familiar with either, but the tangential map is uh, a map that is much more sensitive to look at the geometry of the surface. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you think of the Earth as a sphere, and you say, OK, the radius of the Earth is 4,000 miles to the center. And if we had a little hump on the surface of the Earth, a hemisphere that was, say, a mile high, well, the radius of that hemisphere would be one mile. And so as you move across on the upper axial power map, it goes from 4,000 miles to 4,001, so it doesn't even show up. It's not any different. So the axial radius would be 4,000, and to the top of that little hemisphere would be 4,001. But on a tangential map, or what's called a meridional curvature map, same as tangential, well, now what happens is it goes from 4,000 and then it goes to one mile. In other words, the radius of that hemisphere is determined from the surface of the hemisphere and has no uh, relationship to the center of the Earth. So it goes from 4,000 miles to one mile. So it's very sensitive. So the tangential map is, again, a local radius of curvature map, and it does allow you to see changes in radii very sensitively so it's easier to pick up changes in the surface. The normal values for tangential is 48 uh, and for suspicious and 50 for abnormal. So that's where those values, again, two standard deviations and three from the uh, mean value. Now when you look at the central map, uh, the central column, you see the normal pictometry map and like we said, that normal pachymetry map should be thinnest in the center, get thicker in the periphery, and it uh, looks just like this in almost everything. It's normal. The relative pachymetry map, as we see here, uh, should be green everywhere. That is, uh, if it's less than plus or minus 5% at all points, then we see a green map. And again, over here, if it's normal, we'll see green. So green represents normal. Blue colors actually represent uh, values that are thicker than average for pachymetry, flatter than average for Ks, and uh, values that are lower than normal. So blue colors are safe. And red colors are what we want to warn the doctor about. So anytime you see a red color, that means that we've moved into an abnormal range. So uh, again, red colors would be more than 8%, 5% being suspicious. And over here, the elevations, which again, we show you the numbers, those elevations actually allow us to uh, see how high it is above the reference surface, which we said was a best fit toric ellipsoid. So that's what that BFDEF means, best fit toric ellipsoid. Now, the... Uh, That. Okay, so that's what we see over here on our uh, on our map. Now, again, 
This is 9 and 10 microns. This is the elevation above the front surface. This is the elevation above the back surface, so they're normal. And uh, so again, red colors are things that we would be concerned about. Next slide. So as we're looking at this, as I said, the toric ellipsoid is the, uh, is the best reference to use because that's the normal shape of the cornea. And astigmatism is something that we wouldn't consider as normal, but it's something that we recognize when we see a bow tie. So if we shoot, use a toric ellipsoid, we end up eliminating all of the things that we consider as normal, and the only things that show up are abnormalities, as we uh, would do if we fit with an ellipsoid. Now what happens is that if we fit with the circle bow, which is what we showed in that previous, we would end up with the center of the football above and the periphery below. And so a sphere is not the best thing to uh, compare the cornea to because it's not the normal shape. So if we compare it to the normal shape, we pick up things like you see here, like irregularity. So it's much more valuable for us to use a uh, normal shape for the cornea as the reference so we can pick these things. Now, as we look at this, you can see here, this uses a sphere as a reference shape. Now, this is the same surface that uh, we looked at before. And what happens is you get this band going across the middle. And also, when you use a sphere, you get a lot of red in the periphery because the normal cornea uh, is folate, so it gets uh, deep in the center and flatter in the periphery. So the changes that you get uh, are uh, this band across the middle for astigmatism, and you always get a change in colors because it's not an elliptical shape. Now, when we get, when we use the uh, toros, that is two spheres, we get rid of the, uh, the, a lot of the band, but we still have the problem of the periphery having changes in colors because it's not an ellipsoid. So the toric ellipsoid, next slide, is our best fit. And this is just showing the ellipsoid fit without the astigmatism. And then when we do all of that together, the toric ellipsoid fix, then we end up seeing that we've got two little areas out here that are a little elevated. This is on the back surface, so that's just at the level of being uh, uh, suspicious. And so we would uh, look at that very closely. Now, as we, uh, next slide. So that's the maps. Now let's look at the maps uh, for real patients and see what the uh, what we can observe from looking at that. Now when we look at the top, we see the Ks are pretty normal. We see the ratio 81%, 82 is normal. The quality of the image is okay. The uh, KM, this estimated pre-refractive K, 43.7 is very close to the 42.9, so this patient hasn't had refractive surgery, and all it's saying is that because it's not 82, that that cornea could be a little bit steeper before it had refractive surgery, but within plus or minus one or two doctors, it's not much of a difference. We want you to have this value because in IOL calculations, we call it a double K method, you want to put in what the Ks were before refractive surgery to size the eye, and the current K reading in, what we're going to call the EKR, or what the virgin's power of the cornea is after the refractive surgery. So the pre-refractive K is to what the value that you enter into a double K calculator to size the eye for the effective lens position. And the current Ks are what you use to calculate the power of the IOL uh, based upon the virgin's power of the cornea. Now, as we look over here, uh, what we see is that uh, little red area up here, little yellow, I mean, yellow area up here, yellow here. Well, those are very much under the 48th doctor limit that we set for suspicious, so that's not that normal at all. 1% is the variation that's way below suspicious here. And 10 and 9 microns is still below our level of suspicion, so this is nothing for us to worry about. Next slide.
Now in this patient, 47.3 for the sagittal curvature up here at the top. 48.9 is the biggest value that you see right here. Uh, 539, the normal cornea is right around 555 or so. So, uh, so these are normal values. 6%. Well, it's up in an upper out region. This is a right eye, so it's super temporally, but you can still have cones and abnormalities up here. But it's just barely suspicious. And then as we look at the elevation maps, we see that it's uh, four microns above on the front. And here's a uh, five micron down here. But again, that five micron is way below the 12. It's 2.8 at the same uh, area down here. So that's not abnormal. So when we look at this sort of cross, we see that from our appearance, this is a fairly normal cornea again nothing that we're worried about or would prevent us from having a practice surgery. Next slide. You might notice that patient has two doctors with astigmatism and it doesn't show up as being a problem because we use the toric elixoid map. All right, next slide. <clears throat> now on this slide, <clears throat> we see now, okay, go back one. Back one here. Now on this slide we look and we see, okay, we've got a yellow area down here on the tangential map and on the sagittal map. So it shows up on both. Normal thickness, we do see that on the pectometry map that the uh, bullseye or the center of the thinnest part is a little bit displaced inferiorly. So that's something we want to know. We look down here and we see a 7.8 that's almost at the abnormal and we look over here and we see that the elevation is 57 microns above that. This is 18 microns. Let's back up one slide. This is the left eye. Let's go back and look at the right eye. We skipped over that. And what we see here is in that right eye, 47.3, suspicious, 5.7, suspicious, and 14. Suspicious. This is the patient's right eye. Now, 14 wasn't anything, and you notice it's higher on the back than it is on the front. Now, the normal corneal epithelial thickness is about 50 microns. In each epithelial cell, there's about six to eight epithelial cells forming the epithelium, and each one of those are about six to eight microns thick. So a difference of six microns here would be the basically one epithelial cell. Instead of six at this area right here, he's only got five. And what's happened is the lid, as it goes back and forth, rubs across the surface of the cornea, and it ends up rubbing the epithelial cell off so that it's a little bit thinner, and the result of the epithelium is so it actually maintains a smoother surface. So what we're saying is the back surface, the back surface of the cornea is basically the uh, the back surface of the cornea is much more sensitive in picking up elevation than uh, the front surface of the cornea. So. And it is not uncommon for it to be one or two epithelial cells uh, thinner. And that's an indication that it is actually a problem with the back surface being elevated and that the lid, as it moves across that surface, rubs off the epithelial cells. And so the body is basically trying to maintain a smooth surface so that it does not uh, have as much irregularity on the back uh, surface uh, you'll have a much greater change on the back surface than you do on the front surface. So uh, I see a comment here that they can't see the pointer. So uh, can you see that, Craig? Well, anyway, in the lower right-hand corner, that yes, sorry, Jack. Line. Yes, I, yes, I can see the pointer now. So keep going. Is it my pointer that you see, or that other one? The no, one? your pointer. Go ahead. Okay, good. 
All right, so anyway, what happens is this 14 micron is suspicious, and this is the patient's right eye. So when we look at the next slide, what you see is that the uh, left eye is a clear tone. Next slide. Uh, Jack, so you've got full control, so you can just use your keys. Yeah, I have, but it doesn't advance when I hit it. When I hit it, it doesn't advance. So that's why I keep um, I, that's what I'm saying. I hit the keys, but it's not changing. Okay, okay, there you go. So, yeah, did you do that or did I do that? I did that. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Mine's not advancing, so I need you to do that. Can okay. you see my mouse now on the 57 micron? Not yet. Okay, well, that's what I thought also. So it's taken about 10 seconds for that to show up. The point is that if you look at the lower right hand, this is the uh, left eye of that same patient. So clearly that elevated this tone, 18 microns again, because the epithelium is being rubbed off uh, above. And so, uh, Craig, go ahead and move your pointer for me up there. So you see the 18 microns on the upper right now, and you see the 57 microns on the lower right now. And what that indicates is that this is definitely a cone, and it's always more sensitive in terms of the elevation being higher on the uh, back surface when it's a cone than it is on the front. All right, now, when we look at this map, what we see is that the uh, first column, again, we see a 22.8 uh, as uh, the steepest power, but what really stands out is we've got about 37 diopters of power in the center. And when we look on the tangential map, we see variation that goes from about 36.9 out to 43. So again, we have a cornea that's flatter in the center than the periphery, so that's abnormal. We look at the tachymetry map, and the upper map much thinner than the average uh, 550 uh, microns, uh, but it's a bullseye. It's central. We didn't see a displacer like we saw in that cone that was a little inferior. It was just right in the center. And when we look uh, at the lower middle map, we see that this cornea is basically 39% thinner in the uh, center than it is uh, compared to normal. And then we look over to the right, and what we see is uh, the highest point is out in the periphery, about 16 microns. We see in the center, it's actually a minus 13 microns, so there's no protrusion there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's normal. So what kind of cornea would have 40% thinner in the center, uh, still be a bullseye, and have no elevation on the back? And of course, that would be someone that's had a lacing. And in this one, you can actually see, when we look up here, that uh, the preoperative cornea was probably somewhere around 49 diopters and uh, is now 37. So that's almost a 12 diopter change as much as anybody would do. But the point is that that gives you an idea of what the uh, preoperative corneal power would have been. The one thing that you watch, though, is this little thing that says model up there uh, is the kind of thing that you want to watch because it means that the data points uh, are not normal for a point. And so you, when it's yellow like that, it's something that you can still look at the map, still do the exam, uh, and use this before. forward. Uh, but it's something that's warning you that it's not exactly uh, a normally shaped cornea, and we know after LASIK that's not the case anyway. All right, next slide. So, uh, what we see is, from looking at that first page of the report, that there's the bottom row was the uh, most important uh, area of the map to look at. The axial power map is important 
but the tangential map shows the geometry much more sensitively. So in the first column, we would look at that as smart. The relative tachymetry map, we saw two things. We saw that on the tachymetry, when the center of the map is decentered, uh, that's a concern. And then when we end up with a relative percentage staining that's uh, over 8%, well, that's a warning that that's abnormal. And then we saw that when that's associated in the same area with an elevation, posteriorly, again, because that's more sensitive, of over 15 microns, well, that's something that we're very concerned about, and it would be suggestive that that indeed is uh, a patient with keratoconus. So what we're looking at is then three different things, primarily on the bottom row. Now, when you're looking at those, obviously, the main thing that if you see red in all three of those bottom maps on the bottom row, well, then that's something that you're worried about and concerned that you wouldn't want to do refractive surgery on that person, simply because you've got too many uh, things there that that's abnormal and something that you should worry about. All right. Now, the second page of the report uh, relates to uh, the determination of the IOL power of the cornea. And let's see here. We've got a little question. It says, uh, uh, how do you use the pentacamp values if you are considering the toric IOL? Well, that's what we're going to talk about right now. That is that the pentacam can measure, does measure, both front and back surface power. And when we report that value, we wrote an article that uh, converts that to what's called an equivalent K reading. And we'll talk about how that relates to that signature now also. Now the first thing that I want to explain is that when we look at uh, corneal power, the EKR basically is the equivalent K reading, not the net power. The net power of the cornea, when the K reading, we call it keratometric power, or K reading, when it's 45 diopters, the actual net power of the cornea is about 44. In other words, the true net power of the cornea is about 2% less, about a diopter, than the K reading that we get. So if it's 45 diopters on the K reading, the real cornea is 44. And all uh, IOL power calculation formulas make that conversion from K reading to uh, net power is the first step of the calculation. So what I'm saying is all IOL calculators that are available today, whether they're toric IOLs or whether they're programs that you buy independently, they all take that 45 dot per K reading and reduce it to about 44 as the first step. So if you were to report uh, 44 diopters, the net K reading, well then the IOL calculator is going to reduce in another diopter down to 43 and you're going to make one diopter error because you've made it a double compensation. So, so here's what happens. We had to develop something called the EKR, which does this. If the back surface of the cornea is normal, that is the radius is 82% of the front surface, then what we do is we calculate that net power, but then we convert it back to a K reading of 45 diopters if the back surface is normal, so that you end up putting that into any calculator that's on the market today. But let's say the back surface of the cornea is three-tenths of a diopter stronger than average. In other words, you've got a patient whose back surface is three-tenths of a diopter stronger. Well, what we would do, instead of reporting 45 diopters, we'd report 44.7, which we call the equivalent K reading, which in essence reports the value back to the uh, doctor that he needs to put into an IOL calculation, but compensates for the back surface of the cornea as it's different 
from normal. Okay, so if the back surface was 82 percent, well then it would report 45 diopters. But if it's, for example, the back surface is a little steeper, so that it's a little more negative than average, well then we would subtract the difference from normal from the back surface from whatever the uh, front surface power is to come up with the equivalent K reading. So the point is that you can use this uh, in your normal IOL calculation. But at the same time, the tomography compensates for the abnormality in the back surface. Now, what that also does is relates to toric IOL. When we go through and we report the EKR, we actually take into account whatever the back surface power of the cornea is in all meridians. So what we actually do is we go point by point over the front surface and the back surface, add those two powers together, and then fit the best uh, toric ellipsoid to that to find the steep and the flat axis. And then we report the meridional principal powers that have been compensated for any additional steepness on the back surface in, in both astigmatism and power so that the K reading you get from the EKR takes into account whether uh, no matter what the back surface astigmatism is. So it accounts for the back surface and yet it still provides the value that allows you to put that into an IOL calculator. So, for example, Doug Koch has, uh, did an article about two years ago that said most patients have a, uh, with the rule of stigmatism on the back of their cornea. And that if you have patients with, uh, with the rule, then you should uh, reduce the power slightly uh, by about a quarter of a dollar, 0.37. And that if they have against the rule, you should increase it by 0.37. Well, that was true in about 90% of the patients. And it didn't account for the fact that some of those were oblique because that with the rule that he's talking about went from 60 to 120 degrees. And so what happens is with the penny cam, we actually take that back surface power wherever axis it is and whatever the power from normal and compensate for the front to report a K reading that gives you the right amount of astigmatism to put into a toric calculator to come up with the right power for uh, your toric IOL. All right. So the point is the equivalent K reading compensates for both spheral equivalent power as well as uh, counting for the uh, astigmatism that's in both the front and the back surface of the point. And those values will be right up here at the top where it says equivalent K reading. Now, at Asperger's, for those of you that are going to Boston, uh, we're about to release a new software that has what's called the EKR65 that I'm going to talk just a little bit about. Uh, but the EKR is still a generation ahead of topographic uh, instrument because it does take into account both the astigmatism, the power of the tax. All right, now that's where you see at the top up there, that's where the equivalent K reading is shown. Now, the article that I was talking about is one that I did with Warren Hill and Andrea Steinmuller. Uh, it's about five years old now and it's in the Journal of Refractive Surgery. So let me show you. Uh, how to do this. There's the article. Now there was a question about the accuracy of the EKR and now there's been subsequent studies that all show that it's within, you know, basically five or six hundredths of a diopter of the true power of the K reading of the corner. So there's no question anymore that those values are right. Now, the EKR value when we're doing it in patients with post-refractive surgery, RK and LASIK. Well, what you saw in those maps that we talked about is that the cornea becomes multifocal after refractive surgery. You're doing myopia, you flatten it in the center, but in order to get back to the peripheral power, you basically dig a hot hole in the center. And as you come out, even though the algorithms are trying to improve, we still end up inducing 
empirical aberration in every study that you see. And that simply means that the phony is multifocal. So the tolerance that we get on K readings, equivalent K readings in LASIK patients, refractive surgery patients, is about a half a dollar. So that means 67% of your patients are going to be within one diopter, but it means at the same or uh, within half a diopter, and 95% will be within one diopter. But that means 5% of your patients will be more than one diopter from the target, uh, more than two standard deviations. And for RK, that value is twice as much. So there'll be as many as 5% that are two diopters. So it's important that you prepare the patients for the fact that if they've had refractive surgery, you may need to tweak them with the fine tune with the laser uh, or something, just because a second procedure, basically, because their corneas have been affected by the refractive surgery, and so the chances of people to set that up are a little bit better. All right, now, uh, the uh, article by Richard Zines and uh, uh, Paul herself showed again that the uh, accuracy of the Pentacan EKR was within five hundredths of a diopter. And here's the other question that comes up. The 4.5 millimeter zone turns out to be the one that correlates best uh, in a virgin cornea. And the reason for that is there's some spherical aberration in the cornea. And in order to agree, when we take the average of the power over the whole 4.5 millimeter surface, it's the point that agrees best with the one that comes from the 2.5 to 3.2 millimeter range. In other words, teratometry measures a ring. It doesn't measure inside that ring or outside that ring. And so what happens is the, uh, the best, when you average over a zone, well, it turns out that the 4.5 millimeter average zonal power agrees best with the 3.2 to 2.5 millimeter diameter ring. And that's why we've always recommended the 4.5 the, uh, uh, millimeter zone is the best. All right, so we answered how accurate the EKR is post-LASIK. It's uh, about a half a diopter on LASIK and about one diopter standard deviation. And uh, let's see what some of the other comments are. Well, one of the things is uh, that the EKR seems to come out with an overestimate of the K reading compared to the historical method. Well, uh, when you use the historical method, you still have to put into the double K calculator what the preoperative cornea was, or you're sizing the eye with a flat cornea. So you have to use something that does the double K. In other words, the historical method does two things. It lets you size the eye with the Ks before surgery, and it lets you use the virgin power app. Well, if you just take the measurement that we get from the Pentacam and you put that into the calculator and don't put that preoperative refractive surgery value in, then you will get a higher value because basically it's going to size the eye with that flatter cornea. And because it thinks it has a flatter cornea, then it ends up basically uh, coming up with a different value. So that has to do with the double K method, and you need to be sure that you put in the double K method, that pre-refractive surgery, and that's what the Pentagon did. Even if you don't have the historical information, it gives you a value that you can plug in uh, by calculating what the shape change in the cornea is and what the new radius is. OK. So now, Jackie, just want me to advance forward? Yeah, okay. please. Yeah. All right. okay. Whenever I say next slide, just step forward. There you go. All right. 
so now there's one more thing that you'll see that I want to go over, and that's what the new software that should be available in Boston is. Uh, it's called the EKR65, and it's not only valuable in post refractive surgery, but PKPs, keratoconus, uh, corneal scars, anything in which you have a regular astigmatism, the EKR65 is valuable. Now, here's what it is. This is a normal cornea, all right? Now, what happens is, in this normal cornea, we have a very steep, narrow peak, and so the cornea is very near 43.1 diopters. The average of all those powers, the mean, is about 42.9. And what this is plotting is what are, what is the power at each point on the cornea when we calculate peak? And it's a histogram, basically, of the frequency of those powers as we look across the surface of the cornea. So the peak, uh, so the corneas, all corneas are multifocal, but if they have a strong peak, you can guarantee that that power is going to be very near about 42.9. 43.1 Now, what happens though is, so this is a normal point. Now let's look at another point here. Again, it gives you these values for the 65% mean, which I'll explain in a second. And again, the four and a half centimeter zone is the one that we found out is the best. Now, in a specific patient, it is true that if you've got somebody that's got a myotic pupil, in other words, a smaller pupil than normal, and their pupils never over three millimeters. But we'll see when we actually look at the table, you should look at the four and a half, the four and the three millimeter zone, and then make a decision based upon the size of the pupil. Let me show you what that would be. So when we look here at these corneas, what you see is we have a normal, we have a LASIK, and we have an RK. Now this is the point. If we look at the normal in the upper left here, what we see is that range is about three diopters with a strong peak. In the LASIK patient, it has about a five diopter range from about 36 to 41 with multiple peaks. And when we look over here in the RK patient, we actually have a bimodal distribution, sort of like a five focal cornea. We've got a peak here and a peak here. Now what happens is, uh, the patient, it's like a diffractive bifocal interocular lens. If you've got two powers, the patient doesn't look through both of them. In other words, if you've got a diffractive multifocal and you've got a plano image on the retina and a plus three image on the retina, well, what happens is when you look at distance, you look through the plano power, and when the object that you're looking at is 33 centimeters, then the one of three diopters is clearer. So you'll actually look through the distance one uh, of the higher power if it's close to emetropia, and you'll look through the lower one if you're looking uh, up close if you were an emetropic patient and had bifocal cornea. Now, we'll see that in the keratoconus patient in a minute where his peak is up around 60, 58, and he's got a paracentral power of about 44, he's going to be looking through that 44 diopter power simply because it's much closer to the emetropic power and he gets better vision. So it's important that we understand that the cornea, when it's multifocal or bifocal, that the patient will look through, if it's bifocal, one to the other. If it's multifocal, then it's a little bit tougher because it's like what we call now an extended depth of focus ILL. It's a blended change, so the patient's going to look through the part of that blend that gives him the best vision, which makes it a little tougher for us to figure that out. But we'll see in a minute that we can use that 65% power. Okay, so as we look at this, uh, this is the post-LASIK patient. You see uh, this very thin area, in fact, right here, that uh, number is just about eight microns, so he's still okay. But the fact is, we've got a very flat zone, and when we look at these powers, we've got a flat 
power here and a steeper power in the annulus. So what happens is when we look at the distribution of that, right here, here again, we've got the flat power in the center. Now look what happens. All right, now we've got a cornea that's multifocal. It's got this wide ring. And so the average was 39.8, the peak was 37.2, and the 65% mean just says, what can I, uh, where can I find 65% of the power in the smallest width or region? And that you have to go through with a little slit, go across here, and it turns out that that 65% is right here. So you see that this is higher. So the patient has a choice of looking through all of this, but what he's going to do is his brain is going to come into this area because 65% of the power will give him the smallest spot, and that actually will give him the best vision. So he's not going to look through the lowest peak of 37. He's not going to look through the 39. So that 38.8 is what we call the EKR 65. And that value is what I would use as the mean K reading for that patient to run the calculation. So you'll see also that it's a little bit flatter than the average K reading of 39.8. And that's what I'm saying. We found this now by doing lots of IOL calculations for people. So in Boston, we're actually going to have a report that gives you the EKR 65 throughout this table so that you don't even have to come down to this. It will be up here, and again, you just look between four and a half and three centimeter zone and make a decision as to what you think the best, uh, you know, related to the size of the patient's pupil of what you think the uh, best pupil size. So this EKR65 is going to be what we're going to be recommending is the best value to use when you're running a calculation on any patient that has and then regular corner. So let me just show you a couple of calculations that we've done for people. And what it basically shows is that if we had used the k-mean of 39.8, these are real patients now that we've done calculations on, that the patient came out 1.12 doctors uh, hyper open. And as you saw, the 65% is 38.8, and he would have come out in essence hematrophic. Now, I'm just showing you a few examples of the scores of calculations that I do for people uh, about every month. So, now, the specific case of the keratoconus, that's the bifocal point. And what happens is, and you can check this, you take a patient with keratoconus and their cornea is 58, say it's a hot spot, and the paracetamol region is about 44, 45, you can hand them a reading card and they can hold that at about 10 centimeters in front of their eye, and they can read J1 plus 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 because it's a bifocal. It's a plus 10. And yet they can look up a distance and they can see uh, 20, 30, 20, 40 vision because they're looking through the paracentral area, and that cone is so far out of focus that it doesn't uh, reduce as much the quality of the image through that lower power. So again, the each KR65 takes care of this. So here's a patient that uh, has a cone and 15 microns, 7%, 10%. Now this is what I'm talking about. Now look, here's what he's got. He's got this hot spot right here. That's his power over here that's about 49 to op. All right. At the same time, He's got this lower power here that's between about right around 45 dots. So what happens is the mean's up around 46. He's got a little smaller peak up here around 50. Uh, you see that, 44, 47, about 46 up here. But the fact is he's looking through this. And the EKR value that we get comes then at about 45 dots. So the mean power of 46.2 is almost about half more than what he actually looked at. So we'll see some more examples of this. But the point is that EKR65 is the right value to use. And it's basically the right value on almost everyone. Because if you have somebody that has 
a normal formula, they're not going to have that bifocal, so the 65% EKR is going to still be, as we saw, within a tenth or two tenths of a diopter of what it was before. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, So, yes, the EKR65 is what I've recommended to use on everyone. Normal patients, post-LASIK patients, keratoconus patients, anybody, whether it's a regular or irregular cornea, the EKR65 will give you the best results because if it's a normal patient with a sharp peak, the EKR65 and the EKR mean are all the same. And in, as they get further apart, the EKR65 is a better value. All right, now let's look at another patient here. Keratoconus, this is just another example. Now look at this. Again, here's his peak for the colony. Here's the peak that he's actually looking at. This peak up here is at 49 diopters, and sometimes uh, on a topographer or a keratometer, it will give you that 49 diopter value, and that's the wrong value to use. It ends up making the selected ILL power that's too low, and it ends up with a uh, power that's far too high. So the EKR65 is the one uh, that uh, gives you the best. Now. The choices, the question uh, that just came up was, or just asked, was what is the right bone size to use for calculating the power? And the point is, again, it relates to the patient's pupil size. Now, the scotopic pupil, we never measure a scotopic pupil. In other words, you can take a neuro-optics pupilometer and get the dark, but that's not realistic. Patients, it's using needs optics. It's the same pupil that you see when you're measuring the patient's acuity in a dim room, which is usually about five to ten foot candles per meter squared. It's, the overhead lights are off. You've got the projector on charge, but you've got enough low light level in the room so you can see a chart or something, and that's what you're measuring the patient. Now, in cataract patients, that uh, pupil size is normally about four millimeters and about four millimeters in, uh, in size. So the four and a half millimeter zone is good. But if you're in a dark room and it's three millimeters, it's about plus or minus one uh, millimeter is the standard deviation. So you may have some people in a dark room that are three and a half. So you'll edge down the smaller their pupil, but this is the one that usually is the best, the four and a half. Now again, that same thing is true for a toric IOL. Now, Here's the thing that you have to do. On the current software, we only give you the EKR mean value up here, uh, this one. And you have to look at the EKR 65 at 45.5, and you go up up here, and you take the difference. So this patient's got two doctors of astigmatism. You could also see down on the uh, pre-op screen that two doctors of astigmatism, so you take that EKR 65 and say, okay, he's 46.5 and he is 44.5. He's got two doctors of astigmatism, but you would make the mean value of 45.5 rather than 46.5. What I'm saying is the new software that's coming out in Boston will have just EKR 65 value, so you don't have to do that. In other words, the astigmatism up there and everything will show. Uh, everything will be in the EKR65. So now you have to take the ERK EKR65 value and determine what the astigmatism and add half of it, subtract half of it from the EKR65 value. But the new software will do that automatically, so you don't have to do that uh, on the patient. Okay, the principle here is though, for any person with irregular astigmatism, the EKR65 value is best. You take the astigmatism that you see on the table, again looking at the pupil size of the patient, you add half of that, subtract half of that to get the K reading, 
and if you look at the patient's pupil size and the three, four, and four point five, it's never going to be less than three where you will go down. And it doesn't matter if it's bigger than four and a half because of the Stiles Crawford effect. So you're always limited to those three, four, and four and a half centimeter diameters. Okay. Now, just another example of a keratoconus patient. And what we're showing you is that these errors, these are real patients with real uh, topography that we've done, and basically showing you that these errors could be as much as three and four diopters if the keratometer measures the cone. All right, well, it's getting near uh, 8 o'clock, so let me uh, pull this together, and I'm just showing you that all of these are real patients that we've gone through. This is not a theoretical exercise. Again, bifocal is the shape that you get in the cornea, and all these things uh, that I was showing you here, again, are real patients. And the keratometer, the smaller the size of the circle of the keratometer, the higher the chance that it's going to measure that peak power near the cone rather than measuring what we want, which is the paracentral region. So this was the one where they made about a three dot surprise. So what I'm saying in summary on this is this. The three, four, and four and a half millimeter zones are the ones that we look at. The EKR65 is the mean value that gives you the best chance of making the patient and hitting the target for the spiral equivalent on the button. The astigmatism uh, that's measured by the EKR takes the back surfaces of the cornea into account, and so will give you more astigmatism than most of the against the rule patients, and a little bit less than the with the rule without you having to do a compensation in your head. So the new software that's going to be available in Boston will give you those values directly uh, rather than having to calculate the astigmatism and adding and subtracting it to the sphere of growth. But the bottom line is those values will give you the best results in the patients with the regular astigmatism. And the report, when you look at the first page, will give you the information that you need to look at. At the same time you're examining the patient, to be able to determine whether they have peritonitis, pollution, or any kind of a thing disorder. So I hope that this uh, information that we've uh, gone over in the past hour uh, helps you in caring for your patient. And I appreciate your attention, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Holliday. I do have one question. Uh, with the new software coming out in Boston, how are customers able to access that? Is that going to be accessed through us here at Oculus, or do they just have to access it on the website for the update? No, no, no. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be through you. Okay, so it is through us. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. In other words, what will happen is that EKR65 uh, is the next version of the holiday report. Uh, and I'm not sure, uh, you know, for people that already have the HD system and have that report, I don't know uh, whether they're providing that for the doctors at no cost or not. Since the uh, holiday report was provided with the HD system at no cost, I that will be something that's an automatic upgrade for those people. And for those people that bought the previous, they'll probably do the same thing. Right. Okay, so they just contact us directly at Oculus to get an update for that, and that will be released uh, coming up next week sometime. So by the, think, end, of, by the uh, end of the month? Yeah. I, well, the release is already out. They already have it. Uh, and so it's going to be demonstrated for people who want to look at it up there, and I suspect that all you have to do uh, is uh, ask your representative or the people at the meeting. You don't have to go to Boston. You just tell them you want to get the newer version of the holiday report, the EK65, and they'll take care of it. Great. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll thank talk you. to you later. Um, Bye-bye. Thank you. On behalf of Oculus and the attendees, we thank you very much, Dr. Holliday, for this educational webinar you have shared with us. We look forward to working with you again in the near future.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending another great educational webinar by Oculus and by Dr. Jack Holliday. Please keep watching your emails and Oculus website for other educational webinars on different instruments and topics. The webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Oculus website very soon. The Oculus website is www.oculususa.com. Thank you very much and have a good day.